Our topic for the main service has been and is of the mortification of sin. That may sound strange in our day. The word mortification means killing, to give death to. And what we have been considering now for some time, is the words are found in Romans 8. 13, for if you're living after the flesh, you will die. But after the spirit, if you do mortify the deeds of the body, you will live. The mortification of sin. We come now to the portion of our study, and our study has been based primarily on the work of John Owen when he, one of the Puritan writers, wrote what I believe would be right to call a masterpiece on the topic of the mortification of sin. It's interesting that, as you know, the Lord has entrusted to us a work among prisoners. I counted them up the other day. I'm now working with 20 some odd prisoners in California and one in North Carolina, and uh, the Lord has given us an open door uh, to minister to these men. But one of the things that I've found over the years now is that um, they benefit much from reading the book that I just mentioned, The Mortification of Sin, by John Owen, a Puritan writer. That has been paraphrased into a more easy read uh, edition called The Enemy Within. But I highly recommend that um, you read it. I read it years ago when my son was a teenager. And I had occasion to hand it to him and say, I want you to read this book. And in about a week, he came back, he said, Dad, that is the best book I have ever read. And um, so he benefited from it. And these men in prison who wrestled with the battle of sin, personal sin, temptation, they're surrounded, they breathe it in a prison environment. But there was one recently, about five or six guys formed a Bible study group just to study John Owen's book, The Mortification of Sin. So, enough recommendation. You can buy it, read it, benefit from it. But what are we going to consider today? Well, um, John Owen has been dealing with various things, um, precepts that we need to know and follow as we seek to deal with the mortification of sin. Why should that even be an issue? Are we Christians? Are we saved, born again? What's it all with this sin? Uh, yes, there's a battle going on. And that battle is with remaining sin. What happens when we are saved First of all, there is a radical break with the power of sin. We're no longer forced to obey temptation and sin. There's that radical break. Oh, it will come. It comes in the form of temptation. It comes in various forms. Satan attacks many different ways. But that's the first step in sanctification, is that radical break with the power of sin. But the second phase is a process of sanctification. It's the ongoing work of dealing with our remaining sin, with fighting the spiritual battles, with growing in grace, with becoming more and more like Christ. It is called progressive sanctification. Well, how long will that go on? As long as you live. 
as long as you live until your dying breath, progressive sanctification will be a part of your life, growing, maturing in the things of the Lord. Is there a final stage? There is. It's called final sanctification. Do you know what it is? It's the moment you die physically. And what happens to your soul as a believer? Your soul goes to be with the Lord in heaven. And that is the final phase of sanctification. Saved from the presence of sin. Saved from the power of sin. Sinless to love our Lord without a sinning heart to serve him without a sinning heart. Where do we fit in that description? Progressive sanctification. There's a very real spiritual battle going on. It's defined for us in the book of Ephesians, is it not? Take up the whole armor of God for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against spirits of darkness. It's a real battle. And if you don't believe that, you've been really deceived. John Owen takes us through some precepts, some principles. But now he's getting down to the practical application of those principles. And we mentioned that last week. What is the very first thing John Owen tells us we must do? They are listed under what he calls directives. And the very first one he gives us is flee to Christ. Flee to Christ. And you know, there's some solid reasoning behind that. When um, we uh, finish a sermon many times, if we're aware and know about the situation, there are unsaved people present. We particularly address words to them before we close in prayer. And many times the vocabulary includes this, Flee, flee to Christ, flee to him. Why flee to Christ? If you're unsaved, we urge you, flee to Christ. Why would we do that? Because he is the savior of sinners. He died and rose again. And he is the only one able to save your never dying soul. Flee to Christ. But we would use those very same words to those of you who are saved and fighting the battle of sin every day. Those occasions of sin and temptation come frequently. They come daily. It's a battle. And what would our words be to you who have already followed those words in fleeing to Christ as your Savior, the forgiveness of your sin and the giving you of eternal life? Why would we tell you flee to Christ for the very same reason. He is the Savior. He alone has the power to save you from eternal ruin. He alone has the power to save you in that very pressing moment of temptation and to cause you 
to turn your back and walk away from all that you know to be sin. And what is it that we discover in Christ that delivers us from the power of our own remaining sin? Well, Owen tells us that in Christ is an infinite supply of grace. Now, I've chosen my words carefully. In Christ and in Him alone is an infinite supply of grace. Do we still need grace? I thought I had been saved by grace. You were saved by grace. As a gift from God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Well then, what's this grace? It's ongoing grace that is ministered to strengthen you and to protect you and to help you in the battle with remaining sin. Where do you find that grace? You find it in Christ and in Christ alone. I um, worked in my first job in Dallas, Texas as a juvenile probation officer. And um, I won't go into many details except it was quite interesting that at that point, because of different developments within the juvenile department, I ended up being assigned every Mexican boy that got in trouble in Dallas County. That was my caseload, mainly because I could speak Spanish. I had 130 boys on probation. Now, whenever you are dealing with guys that are in trouble, you're dealing with young men who are losing the battle with their own sin nature. I had boys that wanted to go to the training school. You know why? So they could come home and brag about being a one-timer and gain some status. And when that wore off, they wanted to go back and become a two-timer. Do you not see how sin can destroy a life. It's a battle over the lives of young people and of men who are filling our prisons. Sin is a reality, particularly in those who do not know Christ as their Savior. They're being controlled and dominated and ruined and destroyed by a life of sin. But that's not the end of the story. Those who have been saved are still wrestling with the battle of remaining sin. It's a warfare. We need Christ to be saved. We are urged to flee to Christ to be saved from hell and eternal wrath. Owen says, do the same thing to be saved from remaining sin. Why? Because Christ, is to be found in Christ, is not only saving grace initially, 
but there is grace to conquer remaining sin. And I use the word, did you catch it? Infinite grace. Does that say anything to you? What do you understand by infinite grace? The word infinite means without limit. There's just no way you can describe it. The closest I ever come to describing it was going out to the ICR Museum up in the north part of Dallas to their planetarium exhibit. And you get a glimpse of what outer space looks like with all of the planets and their precision courses. But you think that space just goes on and on and on. So does God's grace. It is infinite. No limit. And there's grace in Christ to be found. And there's grace to be experienced in Christ who now is your Lord and Savior if you have been saved. It's not just saving grace. It is preserving grace and persevering grace in the hour of trial and temptation. Flee to Christ and to Him alone. Turn with me to John chapter 1 and verse 16. John chapter 1 and verse 16. Speaking of our Lord, for of his fullness we have all received and grace upon grace. In the Lord Jesus Christ, dear people, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. We have received grace upon grace. Turn with me to Second Timothy. Chapter 2 and verse 1. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. Paul writing to young Timothy. What advice, what counsel does he give him? You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace. What grace? Where is it? Tell me, that is in, that is in Christ Jesus. Owen's point is well taken. Paul's point should be well taken. The advice he gave to Timothy, be strong, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Dear people, that was not just some Nice little cliche, sentimental saying. There's much grace to be found in Christ. And the man of God is to be strengthened in that grace. He is to be constantly going to Christ for that grace. Let me just insert here concerning this grace. Yes, we flee to Christ. But don't overlook the fact that God has given us means of grace. What do I mean by means of grace? I mean God has designed and, of, and provided for us those things through which he can funnel grace into your heart and life and make it available in your life and in your experience. And right now, you're sitting under the means of grace. Public worship 
is a means of grace. It is not intended by God to be an hour and a half of entertainment. God willing, if this service is conducted as it ought to be under the presence of our God, you ought to be able to walk out that door better strengthened, better equipped to resist temptation and to flee to Christ in the hour of trial. You should have received that grace in your heart and life. That's not the only means. When you get up in the morning, do you read your Bible? Do you pray? Do you sing a hymn? You say, Pastor, I don't know a hymn. Well, get you a hymn book and get on the web, right website and I can, we can help you. You can actually play a hymn that's in your hymn book and you can sing that hymn and worship God. That's a means of grace. It's a part of personal worship. It's a part of public worship. The means of grace. There is much grace in reading God's Word. There is much grace in singing a truly biblical hymn, which, by the way, is like a sermon. What about that? Is it any wonder that we become weak and debilitated? and an easy prey for the enemy of our soul when we are failing to, according to Ephesians 6, to take up the whole armor of God. And you want to know how fierce that battle is? Go home and read Ephesians 6. We're not just playing cops and robbers. We're fighting a real battle. And we need all the grace we can get. John Owen says, flee to Christ. What do we do? What do we do when we receive word that your loved one has six months or less to live. What do you do? You can go into denial. There's a number of things you might do. Let me tell you what you need. You need Christ. You need to flee to him. In the hour of desperate personal need, whether it be your life or the life of a loved one, the only strength you're going to find is to be in Christ and in your relationship to him and to him alone. What are the sins you're wrestling with? I don't know. You know. I know some of them that are pretty common. <coughs> lack of patience, anger, coveting, and the list goes on. But when we are being tempted by the tempter himself or by the world in which we live, constantly pressured to be pressed into the world's mold, how do we resist? What means do we have? Owen says, go to Christ. Because in Christ is an infinite supply of grace. 
And what is it we need in our trying times more than anything else? We need grace. You say, Pastor, what is grace? Grace is the God-given desire and the ability to obey God. Grace is the God-given ability to desire and God's will and to obey Him. Isn't that what happened when you got saved? Didn't you desire Him above all else and find in Him grace? For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Grace is a gift of God. It's not something you conjure up. It's something that God gives you in an instant when he does the saving work. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see why we've chosen a Puritan writer to deal with mortification of sin. We've got much more, much more ahead of us. Is this the beginning of fleeing to Christ? In the moment of temptation, in a moment of pressure when we know that we're being tempted. Corinthians tells us that in every temptation there's a way of escape. Joseph found that way of escape. Didn't he? He put some real estate between him and the queen. But Joseph also discovered God's grace for deliverance. Well, may we discover it anew and afresh, day by day, situation by situation, we live in a sin-soaked environment and it's getting worse. May we be light in a very dark place. It's close. Our gracious God, we humbly ask that you would grant grace to worship you. Grant grace to live the Christian life. Grant grace in the hour of trial, heartache, sorrow, pain, and agony. Grant grace to resist the world in which we live, which is seeking in every possible way to press us into the mold of the world. Go with us as we depart. Keep your word and your truth upon our minds and hearts, even through the day, even through the week, till we meet again. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.